So, <laughs> so we are very happy to have uh, Massimo Corrati from NYU. He will tell us about a new formula for angular momentum. Please. Thank you for the invitation. Um, this is the first time I am here in the new building. I visited uh, the Chicago University many times in the past. How do you like Always it? in buildings with thick walls. Um, so <laughs> nice building, right? Huh? Nice building. Nice building. <laughs> <laughs> we can even use cell phones now instead of bringing up. <laughs> um, so uh, this uh, uh, talk would be based on some earlier words, but mostly on this one. Uh, where I, we understood things that uh, are very simple, but uh, were not noticed in the literature uh, before. So, let's um, see, to use the old system. Okay. So the uh, plan of, of the talk is given here. I will introduce the notations, things that probably you know very well. So I will write an asymptotically flat metric in a convenient form, in a particular coordinate system, um, and uh, use that to describe the um, asymptotic <clears throat> symmetries of this metric. Um, it, this asymptotic symmetry contains uh, quantities that we know very well, like energy and angular momentum, and also other. Um, so there are generators of other symmetries uh, uh, called super translations. They give rise to an ambiguity in the definition of angular momentum and also in the definition of the flux of the angular momentum and the other Lorentz charges. Boosts. Um, this ambiguity, though perfectly reasonable, uh, creates some problem, and, uh, and this the problems uh, prompted new definitions for angular momentum uh, and for the flux for angular momentum. Uh, this activity has been going on for several years in the past, and has been done by several groups. So uh, there are different definitions for this super translation invariant objects. And so I will compare uh, two of them, essentially, that are what they think are the good representatives of what you can get. I will also give them a physical interpretation of these uh, objects. And then notice a problem, which to my knowledge was not noticed before, namely a problem with the Lorentz covariance of all the uh, formulas for super translation invariant angular momentum in the literature. Uh, and the problem is very basic. Um, and uh, so, and it combines with something that was hidden in the definition of uh, angular momentum, in the new definition. Um, now, there are two problems, uh, one that is in, uh, hidden in here, we'll explain what it is, and one here, and the two actually can be combined and solve each other in a sense. So I will present for you a, a fully Lorentz covariant definition of the Lorentz charges and the Lorentz fluxes, angular momentum and boost, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this definition still uh, allows some tweaking, some variation, but they are harmless uh, at least at lowest order in an expansion in powers of the Newton at constant. And I will uh, finish with some final notes of caution and also with uh, uh, some words about uh, the relation of what we did with other definitions of um, not only of uh, angular momentum, etc., but also the Lorentz algebra. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, the metric. Here I use uh, retarded time u, uh, radius r, and two angular coordinates, theta a, that parameterize what is called the celestial sphere. The metric far away from a source in an asymptotically flat uh, space time can be written in a uh, particular gauge, in a convenient gauge, which is called the bounding gauge. In this way, now you see that there are some leading terms here. This is the R squared times H, uh, 
um, that uh, are just uh, flat space time. And then the effect of the gravitational fields is contained in subleading terms. In this term over here, CIP is called the shear. In M, M is a function of a retarded time and the angular variable. And this is uh, what uh, is called uh, the mass aspect. And then there are other quantities that are important, this one in particular, because uh, they parameterize uh, angular momentum. <clears throat> so why is this uh, metric interesting in this form? Uh, because it's um, rather easy to see that the metric is invariant under uh, asymptotic uh, isometries. So isometries that leave the metric up into this form up to terms that decay faster with R than the terms that they wrote here. Um, so in particular, there are uh, Lorentz transformations. We know that they should be there, right? They, uh, uh, the interesting thing is that they act uh, on the celestial sphere as conformal isometries. So these are transformations that uh, leave the metric HAB invariant up to a scaling, to a conformal scaling. There are also other symmetries that uh, uh, were not expected until they were discovered in the 1960s uh, called super translations. At leading order in the radius, they act as a shift of the retarded time that depends on the angle on the celestial sphere. And uh, they act on the shear, on CAB. CAB is symmetric and traceless um, in this way. <clears throat> so the uh, CAB is not invariant under these transformations, but uh, 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 transforms like this. Uh, and uh, what else should we say? Well, we should say that uh, once <clears throat> we uh, have symmetries, we also have the generators, the charges associated to these symmetries, uh, in particular, the super translation charge, charges are given by this formula. F is a function of the celestial sphere on a sphere, right? So it can be expanded in spherical harmonics. There is an infinite number of charges Q, and the first four, the S wave and P wave, are particularly interesting because this is the energy and this is the angular momentum of the space time. So we recover known quantities and known conserved objects in this format. Now, uh, we can also write the Lorentz charges. Uh, in, indeed, we can write Lorentz charges uh, at a given retarded time u. These are what are called bondy charges. Um, so in, when you <clears throat> work at non-infinity, Right. You can define a charge at a fixed value of retarded time. This object is not conserved, but in the presence of um, a gravitational radiation, of radiation in general, anything carried by, by massless particles. Uh, and when you have a source that radiates away, those charges decrease. So the total conserved charge of space time is this object <clears throat> for any charge. Is this object evaluated at a few called minus infinity at past? of future non -thing. Um, But you can define this, uh, uh, this bondy charge. Um, so again, the charge at fixed retarded time at any fixed retarded time, and it's given by this formula, where n is one of the coefficients that we uh, uh, found in the metric. Uh, y, the yA are the uh, conformal killing vectors of the celestial sphere. So uh, uh, conformal iso global isometries of the sphere parameterize S to C, which is indeed the Lorentz uh, group. Um, this YA obey um, the equations of a conformal killing vector, so they have this space. For rotations, actually, uh, the YA are true isometries of the sphere, so the divergence of Y is equal to zero. And for boosts, instead, uh, the divergence of C is not zero, but the boost can be written as the divergence of a scalar that obeys uh, this um, uh, differential equation. So it is an, uh, an L equal to one harmonic. It's a P wave. And this formula is quite convenient for calculations. Okay, so that's part of the story. Once we have uh, the uh, charges, in particular the charges for rotations and boosts, um, we uh, can compute uh, the flux of uh, this 
conserved quantities at two different values of the retarded time. In particular, the total flux, what is uh, the total amount, say, of angular momentum that is uh, radiated away in, uh, uh, by, by any radiation that can go to non-infinity, so in particular by gravitational waves, is given by computing the difference of these two quantities at plus infinity and minus infinity in retarded time, so the future and past, future and non-infinity. Now, um, one uh, peculiarity of this definition is that under super translations, so when we shift the retarded time in this way, the angular momentum uh, aspect, which is N, and the bonded charges transform. So the angular momentum aspect, that's quantity N, uh, transforms in this way uh, when uh, U is either plus or minus infinity. Um, when there is radiation, the, the transformations become a bit messy, but I'm always thinking to situations where very far in the past and very far in the future, there is no gravitational radiation. So space-time is non-radiating at early times and at late times. In this case, the transformations for N are simple, but non trivial. There is this piece. And, and uh, this transformation, when plugged into the formula for the charges, tells me that the <clears throat> uh, charges, in particular, say, angular momentum, uh, transforms under super translation. Indeed, not only uh, the charges, but even the fluxes are not invariant under super translation. Does this correspond to going at some, to something like a rotating frame in infinity? Um, not super translations. Uh, this com uh, corresponds to taking a different uh, slice of what you call equal time on the celestial sphere, so, uh, which still is uh, an asymptotic isometry. So you can call the surface of equal time can be wiggle of f. But above this uh, super translation, there is also translations. And uh, uh, so maybe it's not surprising that uh, uh, this J is not invariant because angular neither angular momentum nor angular momentum flux, uh, fluxes uh, are invariant under translations. Yeah. I mean, you can change uh, the value of the angular momentum flux by a translation if you measure it from some random place in space. <clears throat> I think, wait, wait, should, should they be invariant? Because these, isn't this really global symmetry? In the well, uh, should be invariant. Uh, uh, well, no, but uh, this may create a problem, right? So uh, I'm not trying to say that they are, this definition are inconsistent, and indeed they are perfectly consistent. Uh, but there is a problem with the non invariance, and it's the following, right? So, as I said before, the total. Uh, Concerned angular momentum is evaluated in the Penrose diagram of flat space time here at the past of uh, future non infinity, right? At u equals minus infinity. The flux is the difference, the difference between flux at plus um, angular momentum at plus infinity minus angular momentum at minus infinity. And then when you have a scattering process where you have some, I know, some radiation that comes in, some particles, they scatter, they give off uh, uh, gravitational radiation, and then the flux is computed by taking this difference. Okay, so uh, this is exactly what we expect. Uh, the flux, as I say, can be changed by a super translation uh, because uh, the change in the flux is equal to the super translation times the change in the mass aspect. And the mass aspect can change. Imagine an extreme case in which all the mass uh, is given away by gravitational radiation. So the mass at the end of uh, here, at the end of uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the scattering process is zero before it's not zero, so this delta doesn't vanish. When you um, apply super translation, the flux changes in this way. As you see, the change is zero if the mass is the same, the mass aspect is the same before and after uh, radiation, but generically this object changes. I mean, is it uh, uh, a problem? No, but it is annoying. This fact is annoying because uh, you can think of super translations as a limit. Yeah. It's an infinite wavelength limit of a gravitational wave. So you can think of the super translation as the limit of a gravitational wave that does not depend on retarded time. Now, uh, the fact that an object that you think you can measure, an observable quantity, can, can be changed by 
something that is not observable by local observers may be annoying right? because a very, very long wavelength is not observable by an object that has a finite sign. <laughs> so it, 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 this is not a contradiction. I mean, we have even the simplest uh, uh, examples of that. You are talking about angular momentum. So clearly, uh, if, if you have momentum times the, um, the distance from the point where you measure angular momentum from the arm, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, this object, this uh, and the torque in particular, so the time derivative of p times x can be as large as you want, even when p is small, p and p dot are small. And so uh, it's a fact of life of angular momentum. On the other hand, this property may make this flux not useful because after all, we may want to have a quantity associated to a given physical process. Say you see a merger of two black holes and this, mm, process gives off gravitational radiation. This gravitational ra radiation carries away energy and angular momentum. We may want to associate uh, a, an amount of angular momentum to the process, not to a background, not to uh, this process plus a wave that happened to pass by. Right? So it, it makes sense to try to look at quantities that are invariant under super translations, just to be able to uh, distinguish, say, it's a, hard scattering event from a background. And indeed, this is what several groups have tried to do in the past. Um, there are um, several definitions of super translation invariant charges. Um, I'll give you just two. One uh, that uh, uh, I will call the JKT prescription. <coughs> And that was given by what, myself and uh, JNK, uh, my student uh, Reza Javadi Nezad and uh, uh, Uri Kohl. And uh, I call it J, uh, JKP to keep on a tradition in physics because Compare had that formula before us. So in physics, you always name things with the last person who discovered it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, and um, the other one, instead, this was done by, by them, is a prescription uh, of the Yao group of Chen, Wang, Wang, and Yao. Now, they are not the same. So, how do you, uh, what's the difference? Well, you see, the, the, in our prescription, we do the following. Well, first of all, we notice that uh, uh, in non radiative regions of space time, before gravitational waves, uh, arrive and after they have passed, uh, the shear actually can be written as the, a traceless double divergence of a scalar. Or if you want, you can take this C and take the, the traceless double gradient, sorry, double gradient. You can take this CAB, take a, a double divergence and get and use it to define a scalar C. This scalar C sometimes is called the boundary graviton or the electric shear depending on the uh, on where you are, uh, what um, article you are uh, reading. So, um, and uh, here I am interested in computing the C uh, only at very, at the, very far in the past and very far in the future. You could define this C at any intermediate time, but we don't need that. We only need to compute uh, this quantity in the past and in the future because we are interested in the total flux. Uh, so, once I have C, I can define this object, and in particular, I can define two of them, a C in the future and a C in the past, a boundary graviton in the future and the boundary graviton in the past. Then, with uh, this object, I can construct this quantity that is defined in terms of the mass aspect and this boundary graviton. The, indeed, this <laughs> quantity can be defined for any two quantities uh, that transform as a uh, conformal primaries of weight three half and minus one half. So you see that this, this formula can be written in two different ways. These are two equivalent ways. Uh, here, A and B are objects that have, uh, that under the um, conformal isometries of the sphere have weight three half for A and minus one half for B. And the transformation law for any with conformal weight W under a conformal isometry is given by this form. Should I worry that C, C plus and minus are not really locally defined in terms of data of the metric? 
Well, uh, the, um, you should worry. Uh, well, this is not such a bad locality because we are working on a sphere, so we, we can expand the spherical harmonics and, uh, um, and determine all the coefficients of the C in terms of the oh, this, is a, this is just an equation on the sphere. It's an equation of the celestial sphere. Oh. Now, of course, how to collect data on a celestial sphere uh, no, for us? No, 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 let's say that we can do that. Uh, now, um, both these formulas are invariant simply because this boundary gravitons shift, uh, they inherit the transformation law under super translation uh, follows from the transformation law of C, of CAB, of the shear. Uh, the um, mass aspect uh, in non radiative regions is invariant under solar mm -hmm. translation. So if you plug this transformation law into this formula, you'll see that the change here cancels exactly the change in the canonical definition of the angular momentum, the one given only in terms of the uh, angular momentum aspect, N, capital N. Uh, notice the difference here. We at both in the future and in the past, we subtract a quantity defined in terms of the mass aspect, past mass aspect or future mass aspect, but always in terms of C minus, which is actually what we should truly call the boundary uh, graviton. This is the, uh, an independent degree of freedom that I have to introduce to define my scattering problem. So uh, everything is defined in terms of the past uh, boundary graviton here. For the definition of uh, um, Chen, Wang, Wang, and Yao, uh, you uh, at future, uh, in the future, you subtract the mass aspect at equal plus infinity, U equals plus infinity, and the future boundary gravity. And in the past, you subtract the past boundary gravity. So there is a difference between the two. It seems small, but uh, uh, it has turns out to be quite significant. So this definition is the one also given by compare, and is the one that really uses the only independent dynamical variable that you have to add to your system besides the uh, CAB. It says better the time derivative of the CAB to define a scattering problem. Okay. <clears throat> what, 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 how do you physically think about C minus in this background? Um, well, uh, this C minus, uh, I would say that probably is what defines uh, let's see, how do you think? Before any gravitational wave uh, arrives, the metric has a um, um, the metric to leading order in one over R is say the round metric of the sphere. But at subleading order, there is a piece that's proportion that uh, distorts this uh, metric. Uh, and since you are in a non-radiative region, you can prove that, that this distortion is the double gradient of C. So double gradient of C appears in the, uh, as a distortion of the metric in the past, before. So the far past, before any radiation, the, the, I shouldn't think about it as, it's the, the, the double gradient gives the initial shear. Now, the fact that this double gradient will play a role here. So, uh, if you take C and you take BADB minus trace, that's the initial shear. So, if, if, I, if I thought about a Hamiltonian formulation and looking at some Cauchy slice in the far past, is there a nice physical way to, to change that? To specify that in terms of data in the, in the box, um, was it just a, at, at this stage? I think it's an initial. At this stage, it's an initial condition. Here, uh, I see that in, in this in the bounded formal is when you work on null surfaces. Well, null surfaces are on one side Cauchy surfaces because you mm -hmm. uh, you give initial data on this or final data in this case on, on a null surface. On the other hand, you can think that, that there is a time evolution in this. So uh, uh, I suppose that it's one of the peculiarities of working with null surfaces that you have some object that can be given to different interpretations. But the fact that uh, the shear is actually a gradient of, of C will play a role. And uh, so keep that in mind for, for the future. Um, here, I want just to um, show what's the difference between the two prescriptions that I gave here. And let me start to describe a shortcoming of uh, our prescription. When we compute the uh, different the uh, flux 
of angular momentum in our prescription, well, it's given by uh, the difference of the two angular momenta in the future and the past, and that's given by this formula with a single C minus. No? The, the, the boundary gravity is always the one at minus infinity. Now, there is a redundancy in the uh, description of the shear. C is a scalar, it has all harmonics, but the S and P wave do not change the, uh, the shear because when you apply a, a, a double gradient and you take out the traces, uh, they cancel. So we have to set the uh, uh, L equals zero and L equal to one components of C, the S and P wave to zero by hand. We can do that, but again, keep in mind this fact. Uh, and now, well, we can um, we can play some games. For instance, we can write <clears throat> this canonical flux, the one uh, the the VMS uh, flux, using Einstein's equations, using some of the equations that are constrained in reality when you work in not coordinates, uh, in terms of an integral over the entire uh, future null infinity. So this is a three-dimensional integral over uh, future null infinity. Celestial sphere and the retarding time. So, um, and n is what is called the bond in use, is the uh, uh, time derivative of the shear. Okay. Now, um, okay, this is the same formula that they gave before. Now, since the formula that we gave, the, the JKP, is super translation invariant, I can do a super translation and set C minus equal to zero, and then. <laughs> In the particular super translation frame where C minus is equal to zero, the standard definition and hours coincide. Right? It's like computing, uh, say, the uh, P square for a particle in the rest frame. Right? You can just compute the energy. Uh, so uh, now, on the other hand, since in the frame uh, where C minus is equal to zero, we can integrate the uh, Time time component of Einstein's equation and get, uh, and get this formula that gives the, the uh, well, this, in particular, the double gradient of C uh, in terms of this integral. Now, the, this piece over here is simply all the um, energy that uh, is carried by gravitational waves, by true gravitational waves with finite wavelength that passes through. Uh, infinity from minus infinity to u. And you can find quite easily that this order g q, where g is Newton's constant. And when you compute this difference, well, this difference is the mass aspect, the initial mass aspect minus the final one. Uh, if you look at a simple case where you have point particles that scatter, right? This mass aspect is a function of the momenta of the initial and final particles. So you have a mass aspect contains a piece that is just the energy of each of the n particles that undergo scattering, right? So, uh, and since gravitational scattering goes to zero when the Newton constant vanishes, right? Uh, the change in the angular momentum is order g. This m, just to confuse notation, is g times what you would call normally the mass. So this entire thing is order g squared. So, okay, this uh, expression tells you that this quantity, you remember, this is what we use to compute the to compute uh, the boundary gravity of time C, right, um, is order uh, G cube. Okay, else, well, the point is that uh, now um, the, you, the, uh, you started with C equal to zero, the time derivative of uh, uh, the shear, it's also order G square. And then you get that uh, the this invariant definition of um, angular momentum flux starts actually at order g cube because you see here you have uh, something that is order g squared times g squared divided by g, same thing here. So you have a formula in which the, the flux of angular momentum begins at order g cube. And that's actually not what we expect. Uh, in the, it's not what we expect even from the textbook calculations. So to see why this is a problem, why the fact that this formula begins at order g cube um, is a problem, let's look at a rotation. So let's look at the flux of angular moment. Well, you say, who cares about the flux of angular moment? Well, it is important even for practical calculations. For instance, you can uh, 
to the following. When you want to compute uh, the effect of gravitational radiation in scattering, uh, at the lowest order in, in G, you can use linear response theory. So this means that you can do a computation of, say, the scattering angle of two particles that undergo gravitational scattering, compute it in the um, uh, conservative limit where you have a potential scattering and there is no gravitational radiation, and then uh, compute the effect of radiation by writing the non-radiative k chi, the formula that just gives you the potential scattering, as a function of energy and angular momentum, and then compute the change of the sky uh, when energy and angular momentum that are conserved in, without uh, radiation instead change due to gravitational radiation. So you have a formula that depends on J and, and E. Those are conserved quantities if there was no gravitational radiation. When there is gravitational radiation, uh, the energy changes by an amount delta E. <clears throat> momentum changes by an amount delta J. And then this chi itself changes by this amount. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> now chi begins at order G. And uh, Bini and Damour used the, uh, in a sense, the non-super translation invariant, the uh, ambiguous definition of angular momentum to compute uh, what, what is uh, uh, what are these deltas. Well, delta E begins at order G cube, so to lowest order in G Newton, this piece does not contribute to the uh, uh, to delta. Right. So the effect of this piece is higher order in G. This one, on the other hand, counts because a naive delta J is order G squared. Ours was order G cube, right? So if we substitute our formula for delta J into here, we get that the gravitational radiation doesn't give any effect in the scattering of two particles at order G cube. You have to wait uh, one more order. I mean, do calculations to order G before to see an effect. But that's not true. These formulas uh, give a correct result that has been verified by many groups using all sorts of different methods. Right. So this, this conclusion is that whatever whatever uh, and, uh, we computed may be interesting, but it's not the angular momentum flux that should be used in gravitational scattering computations. There should be another quantity, possibly a well-defined quantity, that does not depend on the super translation frame that uh, could be used in, in instead. And so the quantity that begins at order G squared. <clears throat> and uh, well, actually, there is one such quantity, uh, and that's the flux defined by EPTR collaborators, uh, because actually, uh, the, the slight difference, again, is that. Uh, uh, in their formula, they subtract this object that they call delta J, but in this, in their definition, the boundary graviton is different at plus infinity and minus infinity. They, they use different uh, quantities. So um, what they do is, uh, in their formula, they compute an angular momentum that coincides with the canonical BMS angular momentum in a frame in which the future uh, boundary graviton is zero, and uh, the, mm, at past infinity, they compute a quantity that coincides with the uh, canonical angular momentum in the frame where the past uh, boundary graviton is equal to zero. Now, this seems abstract, but maybe we can make it more con concrete in this way. This difference, the difference computed by the formula of uh, Chen, Wang, Wang, and Yao computes the final angular momentum in a particular super translation frame in which the metric is as round as possible. It's the round metric up to order one over R squared. There are no one over R uh, distortions. Minus the initial angular momentum in a super translation frame where the initial metric was also as round as possible. So here, with this definition, right, we have uh, um, we have set our detectors and our rods, et cetera, to make the metric as round as possible at the beginning. Gravitational pa wave passes. We, we forget about that. We, we come back to our lab and we set the metric back to be HAB at the end of the, uh, uh, of the flux, and then we compute J. 
Uh, so in the, this computation, <clears throat> so is it is it that, so there's some one over R piece of the metric which you say has the information about these super translation. It has the, it has the information about the shear because it's C A B over R. So in, in, at intermediate times, you want to keep it because it has information about the, actually the radiation passes through. But at, after the radiation has passed, this C becomes a pure gradient, D, D of C, right? And indeed, the, it depends only on... So is it the point that if you look far enough away that um, this is some piece of the geometry which can never be changed by any process that's happening at finite wavelengths? Do you like, is, it, is it some like conserved thing that you you know you just sit sit it there once and for all and it, you can't change it uh, by any kind of so the, dynamics? Uh, so you should just track it off. The piece proportional to one over R, uh, this I think is uh, essentially the same color to the black one. So this is very uh, So the there is uh, a, a piece that goes like one over R and very far in the future with some dk dB symmetrized minus the metric times d squared, and, and times this c. Mm -hmm. uh, at u coordinates theta, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, this object changes, and uh, well, there are changes that are order uh, g squared, and you can, in a sense, they are dynamical, they are due to the fact that the wave passes. But then there is also a, um, a change that's uh, lower order, that's order G, and that's the memory effect. Mm -hmm. So this C can be changed uh, because you have a, a long time memory, all right? And uh, it is precisely the, the memory piece that, that <laughs> contributes to the angular momentum flux and gives uh, um, a, a, a term that starts at order G squared instead of G cubed. So, um, it's so it's it's amusing because it's, it, I mean, you say it's, it comes in at order G cubed, but you want something that's order G squared. So why is it? Because it, it's all yes. hidden in here. So, I mean, all the, the, the okay. So this is a, a curious fact. The order G squared contribution to the flux comes from, uh, you know, you can ignore this piece. It comes really from the difference between C plus and C minus between the, 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 these two boundary gravitons. And the, it comes not even from all the difference, but it comes from a term that's order G, and that term comes only from memory effect. So in a sense, it comes from uh, infinite wavelength uh, gravitational waves or zero energy gravitons. So you have this C that changes slowly, uh, under any finite wavelength, uh, this would, the change would be order g square, but with a very, very long, indeed infinite, uh, infinitely long wavelength, this effect accumulated become order g. Uh, so this is the thing that uh, our friend Gabriele Veneziano doesn't like at all, but, but it's, it's a physical effect though. I mean, it's a physical effect, it's a physical effect. So if you formulate it in terms of saying, oh, zero energy gravitons, change a physical quantity, it seems a bit crazy. Yeah. But if you say, no, it's actually memory effects, long time effects, secular effects that change C, then it's less, it's more palatable, right? So it also it. sounds bizarre to say that something that's zero energy or infinite wavelength has any back reaction at all. Well, but there is memory, right? Yeah. I mean, there are secular effects, right? Uh, I mean, we owe the, uh, the Gregorian calendar to secular effects and they are very small. <laughs> so, but indeed, the, the, the change is all, all due to the, the, the changing C, which is, uh, and the change is C, C at inf plus infinity, minus C at minus infinity is indeed D memory. It's what is called D memory. Um, so they're basically taking memory out of the uh, definition of the child. So in our definition, we are, uh, we, 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 we are, we have no memory. Oh, okay. and, and in their definition, they take into account these memory effects. And, uh, and the other thing is that, <laughs> <laughs> the 
you know, just the, the frames that I defined here are both, at the, the initial and final frames are the one that in which the bond the charge coincides with the canonical charge. This is something that uh, Veneziano Milkovitsky argued following uh, what at the time in which they wrote the paper was uh, um, still to be published work by Ashley Caretan. So um, there are arguments that say that actually precisely in the framework, the metric is as round as it can be. Uh, the, what you compute in the bond is coincides also with the again charge. So this may be an explanation why when you compute this initial and final angular momentum in a frame where it coincides with ADM, you are actually computing the same thing that you do with other methods, for instance, um, in uh, uh, computations tied to the source or in, for instance, in the computation that you see in Lantern and Lifshitz, which begins at order G square. So secretly, uh, the uh, computations that look at the, uh, at the source and that the change of mechanical angular momentum are uh, computing the um, canonical ADM angular momentum. But they compute the canonical angular momentum before and after the scattering. So in both frames, you are computing an ADM angular momentum. While we compute the uh, ADM angular momentum at the beginning, and then we follow and we, we see what happens to, uh, to the metric and we include memory effects. Uh, and that corresponds curiously to not including memory effects. So now let's come to, uh, this is an old story, but let's come to uh, uh, covariance, right? Uh, the flux given by, uh, uh, by young collaborators is covariant. <clears throat> if all the quantities included in that we used to define it, uh, transform covariantly. So in particular for the mass aspect and the boundary gravitons, uh, the transformations must be those of uh, a uh, of primary uh, conformal uh, field of weight three half for M and minus one half for C. Okay. Um, so if those formulas are, uh, if you take these formulas, you plug them into the definition of uh, uh, chain one, one, and now you'll see that the formula is actually covariant. Right? So it transforms exactly as. Uh, a flux as an anti-symmetric tensor. Uh, and the transformation laws of, um, of these fields actually can be obtained simply by looking at the standard transfer, uh, Lorentz transformation laws on coordinates and just look at the form, uh, at the form that they assume when you are very far at very large radius. So when here I give you the explicit form, just go for fun, X and X bar are unit vectors that parameterize the celestial sphere, right? So, uh, give the same information as the two angles theta. Now, the uh, in one thing to keep, keep into account is that the, uh, so if you look at the metric, you do a Lorentz boost, and then you look at how the uh, MNC transform, you get this formula. If you want to see what is the charge that generates those transformations, that's the uh, ADM J, is JY at minus infinity. It's not the new definition. <clears throat> Now, this also creates a problem with Lorentz boosts uh, and uh, um, actually creates two problems and they cancel each other. Um, so one is the following. Uh, we were looking at formulas for the angular momentum and the flux and for the boost and the boost flux uh, that uh, <clears throat> was invariant under super translation. But now if we also want covariance, we can prove very easily that Super translation invariance plus covariance implies translation invariance. So whatever we compute is also invariant under translations, not only super translation. So we get an angular momentum that doesn't change under uh, translations, which seems curious, right? That's not the object that appears in the Poincaré algebra. The proof is very simple. Uh, you use just the Jacobi identity uh, where you have super translations, um, any Lorentz transformation J, and any object, any flux, or any other uh, object that transforms as an, an anti-symmetric tensor. Right? So this would be anything that transforms a, like an anti-symmetric tensor. Since F is an anti-symmetric tensor, when commuted with uh, J, you get this formula that depends on an F, right? When you rotate an F, you get an F. So, and now super translation invariance means that F and S commute. So uh, you see this term is equal to zero, but since this commutator is also proportional to F, this term is also equal to zero. Uh, 
So um, this means that uh, this object must vanish by Jacobi. Yeah. And um, on the other hand, when you take a super translation and you do a boost, unfortunately, you get translations. You can get any translation you want, actually, by choosing wisely these two quantities. So this means that actually the, our super translation invariant anti-symmetric tensor must also be invariant under translations. It does it can't play, you cannot use this to generate a Poincaré algebra. So it's something else, right? And what it is, is that uh, the object that we define, if we define it correctly, uh, it's an intrinsic quantity defined with respect to a particular point that defines the origin of a coordinate system. So it is uh, an intrinsic angular momentum. It's not, the, it's not the, what we normally call angular momentum that would change under a translation, right, generically. So it's something else, right? And this something else defines, it needs a point because you have to define this angular momentum with respect to something. And uh, so we need an independent, possibly, covariant prescription to define this origin of the coordinate. This may also so, uh, help with another problem. Uh, it may also <clears throat> fix the uh, L equal to zero and L equal to one components of, the, uh, of this quantity C that you can call boundary graviton or electric object or electric shield. Uh, because those are undetermined. As, as I told you before, there are <clears throat> this, uh, S and P waves that don't appear in the asymptotic metric, don't give the shear. So what's their role? You, and how do you fix them? They seem redundancy. You may say, well, let's send them, set them to zero. Well, you can't, because if you set them to zero in one frame and you do a boost, they are non, generically non-zero in another frame. So um, we have four extra quantities, and also we need to define four quantities, you know, the, the, the time and space origin of the coordinate system. Well, maybe these two problems cancel each other. And we indeed, they, uh, they can, because since we have some redundant components in C, so components that seem to play no role, we maybe can use them uh, to, uh, we can fix them by giving an independent uh, prescription for uh, what we call the origin of the coordinate system. So, uh, and indeed, this is what we do. Will uh, will give a covariance prescription to define what we call the origin of our coordinate system that also fixes the redundancy in the electric shear. We do it in the center of, of in, in the initial center of mass rest frame first. The center of mass rest frame is the frame where uh, the uh, the total momentum of your system, uh, your gravitational system, is zero. So it's the uh, uh, more Covariantly is the frame where the uh, P wave of the mass aspect uh, vanishes. Right, with L equal to one component of the mass aspect vanishes. And let's start to do it first for the true angular momentum at past infinity on, on um, the future non infinity. So U equal minus infinity. Well, uh, when we define the subject, well, we define a class of rest frames. You can still translate them as long as you don't post them. The total angular momentum will be zero. So in, here you have a set, an infinite set of rest frames, and then we have to fix the origin of our coordinates after having uh, uh, say that it, the, the total angular momentum is zero, right? And we can do it very simply, for instance, by requiring that the, uh, our invariant definition of the uh, uh, Lorentz charge is equal to zero when uh, y bar is a pure boost. We are now in a given frame. We can uh, separate rotations and boosts. We say that in this frame, all the uh, when we compute our invariant j, it vanishes. Right? This will actually fix the uh, components the redundant components of C minus. Uh, we can see that even quite explicitly because we can use the formula that uh, uh, I mentioned before for the boost as the uh, uh, gradient of a scalar that has a, an L equal to one. So that's in an, uh, a theory. And then when you uh, 
substitute for uh, in this formula, right? The C, this uh, <clears throat> boundary graviton, of course, does not appear in this formula. Right? Formal contains the uh, angular momentum aspect, not C. Uh, you can expand uh, this C into S, P wave, and all the rest with uh, angular momentum larger than one. And then uh, after some simple calculation, you get this nice formula that very explicitly tells you what are the components of the P wave for the boundary graviton in terms of the rest, in terms of the higher component, higher harmonics. I, I don't know if that, that's, um, that seems to be easy. We can set C minus minus equal to zero. This doesn't seem to give any, any constraint. Right? So we set it by hand and uh, there is no contradiction in setting it by hand. It stays zero if it's zero in one frame. <clears throat> With, you cannot change it by, by boosts. Okay, so you have this very explicit formula that that's, uh, and now you have these two problems that cancel each other. I mean, you, had, you needed to define an origin from which you compute angular momentum, and you needed to fix extra the extra components of the uh, uh, boundary gravity and that goes the both things. In a generic frame, uh, we define the uh, generators by a pure boost from the rest frame. This is actually uniquely defined. So you take uh, you take the pure boosts in the rest frame and you change them by a, a Lorentz transformation that is itself is a boost that takes a, a frame uh, with say velocity zero to a frame with velocity beta, right? Um, and then in any frame, the condition that fixes this uh, uh, redundant components <clears throat> of the uh, boundary graviton is given. It's exactly the same as before, except that now, now this y hat is what is obtained from what was a boost in the rest frame by going to another frame with a pure boost. Uh, now, this definition is actually consistent. And the best way to see it is not to work with spherical harmonics. That's a mess. But it instead is to uh, use a covariant vector notation where the uh, uh, well, well, the flux is an anti-symmetric tensor that called J for short, and Y is a four vector. Four vector is a pure boost in the rest frame, so in the rest frame it has this form. So in any frame, in, in, in uh, the, the definition that we give is that uh, the, this uh, the generator of Lorentz transformations times the whatever is obtained by a pure boost uh, of, uh, from the rest frame vanishes. So this, uh, uh, this is what I will, B times Y bar is what I called Y hat in the previous notation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, now a generic Lorentz transformation can be written as a boost times a rotation. You can also use the other order, but will be not good. Uh, so here boost times a rotation to the, uh, to the right. And then uh, the condition J times Y is uh, Lorentz transformation from the rest frame times Y which is Lorentz transformation times uh, a, times what we call our definition of Y, which is a pure boost. But now you substitute this formula for L. In L minus one, you have R minus one, B minus one. So you, you get this formula, but the rotation on Y bar, since Y bar is this space, is the same, it, it, it gives just Y bar, right? Because uh, the rotation acts only on these three components. And then uh, you get exactly L times the uh, condition that we defined in the rest frame, which is the zero by definition. So what we get is consistent, right? Uh, and then it's also uniquely defined, and this is more or less the same proof as before, right? Because uh, when you uh, take a frame and you boost this frame to another one that moves with velocity v prime, as you know, uh, the um, um, the composition of the uh, uh, the Lorentz transformation of boost L times B is uh, not a pure boost generically, but of course you can always boost back to the rest frame, which means that uh, uh, it, this combination of boost Lorentz boost back to the rest frame is a pure rotation. So again, you compute L dot Y, you substitute the definition of uh, whatever it's, uh, um, so you see, you look at what is a generic Lorentz transformation on Y is Lorentz on this boosted object, which is equal to uh, 
multiply by b of beta prime, right, is equal to b of beta prime times rotation times y, which is equal to b of beta prime times y prime, which is indeed the definition of your vector in the new boosted frame. So you, you don't have, a, a, you always get the same vector, right, in, in any frame. Mm -hmm. um, the definition is unique. So, okay, that satisfies the, uh, the conditions that you want to prove that uh, the one way to define in a covariant way a, an intrinsic angular momentum in, is exactly what we propose here. You say uh, the new definition of angular momentum, and you uh, ask that the Lorentz transformation that is a pure beauty it's a pure boost to propose from the rest of the is, is equal to zero. Um, now, this condition actually is not new. It's implicitly used in most papers on gravitational radiation. When you look at any paper in gravitational radiation, you can see that actually, it, without even bothering to, to say that, uh, uh, the condition that uh, is chosen is this, this one, right? because uh, I mean, if you, if you don't want to go crazy in these computations, you go to a center of mass rest frame, but then you choose the origin of coordinates to coincide with the center of mass, right? So that's what we will do in, in any homework, right? On, uh, which go not only to a, a, a frame where your system doesn't move, in which the center of mass doesn't move, but you choose the origin of the coordinate to, to, to coincide with the center of mass. Um, and this way you can check, for instance, I mean, there, are the, there is a recent paper by um, Manohar and collaborators, and we can explicitly see that that's the, the frame that it's chosen. So now to completely define uh, the um, a covariant and super invariant flux, we also to define what happens at uh, plus infinity in the far future. And, uh, and we have to define uh, the components of the boundary graviton in the, in the far future, because they are not fixed by anything. Uh, I mean, they are not fixed by, uh, by any constraint equation. You can give them a, a random. Um, and now, of course, you have many possibilities. Here, I'm just looking at two, uh, to be brief. We can simply say that uh, um, the boundary graviton at, in the future is the same as in the past, at least the first three components. Again, nothing else fixes them. No constraints, nothing. Or we can uh, say that the boundary gravity of the plus infinity is also defined uh, um, by, uh, by this condition where the, this should have been y tilde, where y tilde is obtained by Lorentz transforming a pure boost to the final center of mass frame. So now, um, this may make a difference when you go uh, beyond the lowest order in computing angular momentum flux. But you can actually show very easily that at least to the to lowest order to prescriptions agree. So if you compute the order G Newton square component of the flux, prescription A and B give the same result. On the other hand, if you want to be precise, you'll have to pick your choice and, and, and follow it, not change it immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so. Um, okay, so as I said before, uh, uh, the um, after the uh, S and P wave of the initial and final boundary graviton are fixed by whatever prescription is your favorite one, for instance, the prescription that I call A and B, uh, the covariant flux uh, actually has a very simple interpretation. It's uh, actually uh, is the bounding definition the BMS definition of, of the uh, of, of the angular momentum or boosts at, 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 in the future minus the one in the past, when both are computed in a metric that is as round as possible, it's H A B plus order of one over R square. And as I said before, I'm repeating myself here. Uh, this is uh, exactly the frame that uh, uh, in which the bondy um, BMS uh, charges coincide with ADM charges. So uh, this quantity over here, now essentially our prescription is the prescription of uh, 
uh, Chen, Wang, Wang, and Yao, but after having fixed this problem with the low um, angular momentum components of the boundary gravity. So this difference is the change, uh, so whatever is computed by this quantity is the change of the total uh, ADM angular momentum. And indeed, uh, mm, uh, these authors verified in some cases that uh, uh, when you compute this quantity in the frames that are as round as possible before and after in the gravitational radiation, uh, you get formulas that coincide with the one given by Pini, the Moore, Manohar, and many other groups. So here, that seems to be a message that uh, uh, the quantity that uh, most people and most uh, authors call angular momentum is uh, the quantity computed in the, um, in the bondy formalism that coincides with the ADM charge. But that's true. Uh, I mean, the definition, the, the bonded definition and the ADM definition coincide only for when the metric is round, it's as round as possible. Now, when I said that uh, the charge coincides with an ADM charge, I was cheating a bit because this identification is valid only for the ADM generators defined with special boundary conditions that forbid super translations. You can also introduce super translations in ADM. As long as you do that, there is no single definition for angular momentum. We have exactly the same ambiguities that we had before, because if the algebra is the same, well, angular momentum and super translations do not commute. So this identification with ADM is a, a, a place in part due to ignorance, because the, until recently, we were not able to introduce the full super translation uh, uh, group into the full super translation algebra, I should say, into ADM. Now we can, uh, through the work of uh, uh, Nino and his collaborators. And at this point, well, we have still to see what, uh, what do we mean by ADM charge, maybe. Um, so appealing as it may be, the identification with the ADM quantities is only valid if boundary conditions at this time for ADM space like infinity are artificially restricted to forbid super translations. And so I would say that maybe we still need a better explanation of this magical coincidence of the quantities that we computed in this frame with ADM. Um, okay, now let me finish with one last observation. Uh, JKT and IMPT are compared, have showed that uh, uh, this quantity, right, the, 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 the JKP charge generates the Poincare algebra. So, how is it consistent with what I told you? That we said, no, this doesn't generate the, the, this doesn't transform covariantly, right? Uh, so, how, how is the fact that this object generates the Poincare algebra consistent with all that we explained in this uh, talk? Well, it, it is because actually this quantity which I can call with this Gothic I, uh, does not generate the Lorentz transformations induced on the asymptotic metric by the coordinate change. Uh, you would say, the, the, when we looked at the way in which the asymptotic field changed, we, do, we did the natural thing. We took a metric, we changed coordinates in the metric, and we looked at how the coefficients of the metric changed. So we did the standard procedure. Right? And uh, now, instead, this object, the Scotic I, generates a linear combination of Lorentz transformations plus generalized super translations that cancel the action of the Lorentz transformation. So uh, you, this object actually does a, what you will call a Lorentz transformation, but then also some super translation that bring back the uh, uh, higher harmonics of the boundary graviton and mass aspect back to to, to zero, so they, they leave them invariant. So it is not the usual generator, and that's actually quite obvious to see, because after all, the transformation of this, uh, uh, say, the boundary graviton under this new transformation, so if you use I as a generator, well, it's given by the commutator of Poisson bracket of I with the boundary graviton. Now, uh, 
the fact that this I is invariant under super translations and also to be invariant under super translations, it has to commute with the higher harmonics of C means that the supermutator vanishes, which means that C doesn't change, right? Same thing for uh, the mass aspect. Uh, super translation invariance means that the I and the, the super the generators of super translation that are the higher harmonics of the mass aspect commute, and that means that uh, the higher harmonics of M are invariant under the transformation generated by I. So this whatever this I does not generate the usual Lorentz transformations. You cannot take a metric, change coordinate, and say, ah, this is the, the uh, whatever I get is the metric in the new frame. So uh, yeah, this is a different object. Basically, that's the point. The, uh, I is an interesting object, but it does generate a, uh, it closes a Poincare algebra, but it's not what generates the standard uh, Lorentz transformations on the asymptotic fields. And in fact, this object belongs to the universal enveloping algebra of a generalization of VMS, but it's not in the VMS algebra. It is an object that's uh, quadratic in these quantities, and uh, uh, both uh, this M and C. Uh, can be seen as generators of some extended BMS algebra, but clearly it's not an element of an algebra. It's a quadratic object. Okay, so uh, I went over time already, so it's a good point to stop. There were already a few questions, so let's thank Massimo again. Very good. Okay.